Gospel music. It's more than just a style of singing. In fact, for some people, it's a way of life. Hi, I'm Charlie Daniels, and I'm the host of a new series that's guaranteed to lift the spirits of anyone who sees it. It's more than the music, and it'll put a song in your heart. Well, it wouldn't take nothing for my journey now. Gotta, Gotta make it to heaven somehow. Shout for the shout, shout for the shout. When you get that feeling, shout for the shout. Each episode takes you behind the scenes to bring you the life-affirming stories of some of gospel music's biggest legends, folks like the Blackwood Brothers. We'll take you beyond the lyrics and show you the heart-wrenching events that have inspired some of the most beloved songs of all time. Best of all, we'll hear from the people who write them and sing them, people like Dottie Rambo. Go backstage with more than the music and experience the triumphs and tragedies of life on the road with some of the greatest artists of the last century, like the Lefebvre family, the Whites, Sandy Patty, and Gary Chapman. Here's just a couple of the stories you'll hear as we take a look at the lives of Howard and Vestal Goodman and the rest of the Goodman clan. One night, uh, we'd been to church and, and run out of gas going home. We didn't have money to buy gas for this old Model A Ford. We were having to push the car up a hill, and we knew if we got it up that hill, uh, it'd coast down and, and, and just nearly get home, and it did. So we was all pushing, my mom's out pushing with all the kids, and everybody got to laughing, just just really laughing, seeing us out there. And she said, turn around, she said, my, this is a happy family. We told different ones about it, and people began to call us happy family. Though Howard was quick to heed God's call, Vestal, like so many of us, wasn't quite sure. I don't really know why she, uh, Vestal was uh, hesitant, because she always had a real interest in church. Daddy would say, you're going to sing and carry the gospel, and you're going to tell people about the Lord. And I'd say, no, 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 Daddy, I'm not going to do that. I'm not going to do that. He said, yes, you are. Because he said, before you were born, I prayed and told God, I want a, another boy. And he said, but before you were born, God told me that he wasn't going to give me another son. That, but you're going to have another girl. But she is going to sing and carry the gospel. And she's going to tell people about the Lord. Daddy was very, very caring and very, very loving and sincere when he got into something like that. And when he talked to her, now honey, this is what you've got to do. If this is what God called you to do, you have no choice. And I would go to bed at night and I'd pull the covers up over my head and pull a, 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 a light in under the covers with me and I'd lay there and I'd read the scriptures and try to talk God out of it. <laughs> my brother Rusty. Yeah. Uh, got sick and was sick a long time. And uh, nobody knew what was wrong with him. And it looked like he was going to die. And I remembered my dad at church one night uh, 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 took him down. And uh, stretched him out on the altar. And I remember the very words my dad said. Lord, you gave him to us, and you've got a right to take him away. <laughs> but we want to keep him, if we can. And you know, from that night, he began to mend and got over that, and nobody ever knew what was wrong with him. But he was healed completely. Howard had come to sing with Cat Freeman, Vestal's brother, and both knew from the moment they met something special was going to happen. And when I got up there that night, well, I met her. And I think she was 16, mm -hmm. 16 years old. When I met him that night, I thought, yeah, he played the piano and sang. Mm, that's interesting. And if God, if you're going to want me to go and sing and do all these things, he'd be awful nice to have around. He went to our house with Kat. And spent the night. Another time or two during that revival, he went back to our house and spent the night. And that gave us time to 
sit on the porch and talk. And we got to know one another quite well. And then he, he told me that, that I was the prettiest thing he'd ever seen, and I was stupid enough to believe it. And I told him he was the best looking thing I'd ever seen, and he was stupid enough to believe it. <laughs> we met this other minister and got with him, and he persuaded us to go with him and take this money and invest it in a truck and a tent. And we was going in the tent meeting. Howard and Vestal followed what they believed to be God's leading, never expecting that their lives would soon be in danger. Our first meeting then, we went to Monroe, Louisiana, in West Monroe, and that was in 1957. Hurricane Audrey came up the coast of Louisiana, killed hundreds of people. The winds and the rain was still so strong until it it tore our tent up, and uh, then we lost everything, the tent, the equipment, and the sound system, and everything there. Vestal was devastated, and she couldn't help but wonder, how could they go on after such an enormous setback? My dad, after he left home and went into the service, um, he, he really, I guess, strayed away from his faith and the way he was raised and his beliefs. And then he, when he came out of the service and he was with the Plainsman, um, I think that was kind of a footloose and fancy free kind of time. And then I think after he got married and um, I came along, I think it was that time in his life when he began to think about what was really important. and. He really recommitted his life to the Lord, and he wanted to leave that life behind and do something different. And he called Howard and me one day and said, said, Howard, I gotta come home. I'm, all, I'm gonna quit the placement, and I'm coming home. I'm coming to, to work with y'all. The Goodmans were excited about the possibility of Rusty's return, and Sam was especially tickled since he and Rusty had always been close friends. But there was also a little apprehension. We didn't know what we was going to do with him. Before long, the Happy Goodmans started making a name for themselves, and they began a grueling but rewarding life on the road, performing the gospel music they loved. The people loved us, liked to see us perform, and that was kindly inviting to us. We became uh, a, a fixture of maybe entertainment, and uh, it just began to grow into that and finally we became uh, really the leading uh, gospel group in the country. We would literally be at church Sunday morning and all th through Wednesday night service and then we would go and sing somewhere or go and preach somewhere in another church because we, uh, our congregation, we had a big crowd opening night but our crowds were not that big. We never had more than 50, 75, 80 people. And they weren't uh, financially stable to support the church. So Howard and me would go off in revivals or sing for churches. And they would give us offerings and we'd come back and help pay all the bills at the church. With the help of a promoter and the support of faithful fans, Howard and Vestal felt that God had opened the door for them to expand their ministry. Rusty and Sam agreed but they all recognized their desperate need for a more modern, and reliable mode of transportation. So Howard looked into the costly option of buying a bus. While he and Rusty worked on getting the money together, Vestal made an agreement with her prayer partner, Hannah, to fast and pray for God's will. The answer would not be long in coming. We had to have $6,000 down. Well, we didn't have 600, much less 6,000. And so I called the the lady in our church that was my prayer partner, Hannah Jackson, and I said, Sister Jackson, for three days, I want you to fast and pray with me. What we were praying for was not just for the 6,000. I said, Hannah, if God wants us to have this bus, then let's tell God, give us 10,000 yeah. to pay down on that bus, and I'll know it's Him, and I'll say, okay, order the bus, we're gonna sing. At the same time, Rusty was always making sure the audience got their money's worth. 
I would say Rusty was the uh, the one who worked us the hardest because he was uh, a perfectionist. Rusty's dedication and creative passion inspired Howard, Vestal, and Sam. Together, the four core members of the Happy Goodman family began to break new ground and experience even greater success. They created quite a stir because they were going against the norm. They were going against what is traditional. They uh, hired uh, some of the greatest guitarists, allowed Ricky to bring drums to the stage. The show was 10 times more exciting, 10 times more vibrant, uh, 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 drew a different audience uh, than just the plain vanilla uh, audience uh, Cortez drew. They were great, they did, they exciting, man, you know, just unbelievable. But the success of having a recording contract wasn't enough for Rusty. His insatiable drive to be better and better produced new, innovative arrangements and songs. But it also had a deeply negative side. Rusty was struggling with depression. I think sometimes my dad felt like uh, that what he heard in his head was unachievable. And I think there were times that it, it, it bugged him. He always had such big dreams and big aspirations and it was all about being a star until he came to the Lord and it was just a real a really humbling thought for him to think that you know Christ who had the ultimate glory could walk away from that and that that's the thing that man is always searching for well we was in a revival at our little church there on Grapevine Road we hadn't had uh, uh, too much of a revival, you know, not much going on. The parsonage was just across the parking lot. And she said Howard was there in the house doing whatever. And she told him, she said, baby, said, I'm going back over to church and pray a while. And uh, she went up the flight of steps up into the church. And I couldn't turn the lights on. There was a hand, felt like a big man's hand over the light switch. And I started praying, oh Jesus, help me. Oh Jesus, help me. There was a, a figure set down by me that was horrible looking. And I'm so petrified and, and he said, don't use that name again. Once doctors at the local hospital had done all they could do, they allowed Vestal to return home. Her friends and family braced for the worst. And when they got me home and, and Howard was gonna take me to Mayo Clinic on Monday morning and on Sunday, when my house filled up with people to tell me bye and they, I looked back, I looked back shortly after that and realized that they had literally come to tell me bye because they didn't think I'd be back home. Rusty and Sam did their best to comfort Howard and encourage Vestal, but even they feared all was lost. Howard knew he had to be strong for the sake of his wife and family, but he couldn't help but wonder, how would they go on without Vestal? Then, just when everything seemed darkest, the impossible happened. That was when contemporary music was really yeah. growing. We didn't want any of and that. And Rusty, at Rusty especially, Rusty and Tanya had been singing some with us. And uh, Rusty and Tanya and even Sam wanted to do more contemporary music. And they wanted to hire this young man to, to sing with them that I didn't approve of his lifestyle. And, uh, and so we said, okay, go. You go right ahead, there it is. But we didn't have a big breakup. It was. Oh, uh, it wasn't no tiny thing. It wasn't. It was. It was, a, know, it was a breakup. Well, I mean, we didn't fight. <laughs> it's just decisions we had to make. It was, it was strong decisions that had to be made, and they they ought they had the right to do what they wanted to do, but so did we. A hundred and hundred fifty dates a year, on a forty foot bus with ten people. You know, there's going to be times that you rub up against one another, and being as close a family as they were. Uh, every now and then they would have a disagreement. And this disagreement ended up in the fact that everybody said, well, we quit right here, right now. The separation continued until one fateful day when Rusty called Howard and Vestal with devastating news. 
Rusty had incurable cancer with little time left to live. Heartbroken, they all realized what they had together was extremely special and regretted the 10 year split. They vowed to make up for lost time and all agreed there was no better way to make amends than to record a reunion album. Rick, uh, uh, he wanted us to get together and make an album. Uh, you know, we didn't, uh, we really didn't look for Rusty to get well, but we didn't, we didn't know, you know. As difficult as it was for Vestal and Howard to hear the news of Rusty's passing, it was Sam who took it the hardest. The loss of his dear friend marked a turning point in his own life, and suddenly the health problems Sam had been coping with seemed to overwhelm him. Losing Rusty was just about as much as I believe Sam could take emotionally. He was just totally devastated. When he was having trouble, he was in the hospital for breathing treatment, and on a Sunday morning, we got a call. And uh, I just remember him crying and saying his buddy was gone. And uh, it was just really tough. You know, they were probably two years apart. Dad was his big brother, so it was probably that much harder on him, just seeing his little brother pass away before him. So uh, he just knew when Rusty left it wasn't going to be long till Sam was going to follow him. When country music superstar George Jones was in a life-threatening car crash, Vestal was able to share this faith with him. When I had my, my accident, when I came out of my coma, my wife said that I uh, started asking for Vestal and uh, uh, why in the world I would do that, I don't know. But Vestal told me that she had been praying on an awful lot for me uh, since the wreck. And, and uh, I think that must have had a lot to do with it. And when I was seven years old, my brother Doyle, who was eight years older than I was, got a little mandolin, and he started playing this mandolin singing, and so I joined him in singing. We started singing duets together then. In churches and schools, we sang duets together, gospel songs and uh, old folk uh, country songs. James' Christian mother was determined not to let their poverty get in the way of her boy's future. Tuition for singing school was $3, and that was a huge sum to a family living hand to mouth. But she sold some of her chickens and gave young James and his older brother Doyle a chance for a better life. The man teaching at, his, teaching at his school, his name was Vardaman Ray. He taught us the do re mis and the shape notes and gave us ear training. Once they got a taste of, of singing school, and they, they I think, James and, and my father discovered that's what they wanted to do. They loved it. They brought a wave into gospel music that gospel music had not seen in my lifetime. The Blackwood Brothers were so great with their harmonies and technically singing. The Blackwood Brothers were unparalleled. Family harmonies and family groups uh, can never be gotten around when it when it comes to singing, and the Lord gave them the, the built-in harmonies. Each drop of blood bought me a meal on me. I was always impressed by the way James Blackwood handled himself. I thought he was a perfect gentleman. And I thought on stage he carried class. And you could, you could feel when the Spirit of God would take over, you could just feel it lift the audience. It takes a special wife, special woman to, to uh Stay, to stay behind, to raise the family, a lot of times almost single-handedly. I knew she wasn't um, like everybody else's mom. She um, managed everything very well. My mom is a hard worker, 
incredibly faithful. When my dad came home, she was very much a servant to him. She, she understood that what he did, while it was very rewarding, what it was what God had called him to do, there was still a great price he paid to do that. And, uh, and she was so supportive of him. I think he not went overboard, but made sure that, well, maybe even sometimes did go overboard, just to, you know, just to really minister to her in ways that were tangible to her that said, I really appreciate your sacrifice. His first love was gospel music. He never lost his love for that. In fact, I remember as a, as a kid, sometimes he'd call the house, and if my dad was there, he'd, he'd say, can you get the guys together? Can y'all come out and sing? And, and my dad would call the guys, and, and they'd go out to, to Graceland. But Elvis Presley was a Christian. I know for a fact he accepted Jesus Christ as a Savior. Cecil told me later that, uh, that he and Elvis went to the same little church, and that they w walked down and professed faith the same morning together. Well, the Blackwood Brothers started the National Quartet Convention in Memphis in 1957. And at all of the early conventions, probably for the, for the, the first 10 years or more, Elvis uh, came to almost every one. Elvis was a big fan of theirs, would come to the concerts in Memphis, and then later when he uh, you know, obviously hit the big time, uh, maintained those relationships with, with Daddy and J.D. We'd be backstage in our concerts and the door would swing open and here Elvis would come in with a, all of his friends and girlfriend and uh, they would sit backstage. And from time to time, we would introduce him and the crowd would go crazy. You know, Elvis was a huge uh, connection with his mother. Everything was his mother. If his mother liked it, he liked it. And his mother liked the Blackwood Brothers. I remember when his mother passed away, he called me and said, uh, said, you're my mama's favorite singers. Would you sing for a few? And I said, of course. So we sang that day for his precious funeral. We ended up singing 10 or 12 of Gladys's favorite hymns. By the 50s, over half of all American families owned a television set. And the Blackwood Brothers made history by becoming the first gospel group ever to appear on national television. Winning first place on one of the era's most popular shows, Arthur Godfrey's Talent Scouts. For people who, aren't, who don't, don't go back that far, uh, before the days of 200 television stations, there were two or three. And Mr. Godfrey, had, he was on the air probably more than any other uh, personality on radio and television. I remember sitting there watching that show, we finally had television, and uh, all of a sudden Arthur Godfrey announces the Blackwood Brothers from Memphis, Tennessee, and I was just in a state of shock. Then when they announced the Blackwood Brothers, my heart was beating extra heavy, you know, because there's the family on nationwide TV. After the show was over, they had going down to New York City's walk around and see the sights and hear people in New York just holler and tooting the horns at them. People would say, hey, there's the Godfrey winners. That's the ones that won the show. That's the Blackwood Brothers. He waved at me as he left and I watched him as he went down that park. I just stood there with my glove and my ball and I had this, I don't know what, why, but I just had a strange feeling. Didn't know why. But I watched him till the car disappeared. So I went on playing my ball game. And uh, the ball game was almost over. And that was back in the days when they didn't have the laws and rules against buzzing the town with a plane or something. People did it all the time. Well, here I saw the, this plane coming. Of course, I looked up and saw a daddy. And he flew down like that and dipped his wing at me, like that. And when, he, when the plane went over, I could see him looking out, just see just a part of his head. And they took the flying back and went and did it like that. And the last time I ever saw him. 46 years. And I still. The plexiglass canopy had been shattered and was gone. And RW, I could see him still strapped in his seat with his head over like this. 
I never saw Bill Lyles. But I started in through the, the fire, started in toward our W. Someone grabbed me from behind and held me. I, I remember trying to get away and they wouldn't let me away. Jake Hess of the Statesman Quartet wrestled James to the ground, saving him from certain death. I didn't even know what I was doing going into that fire. It would have killed me if I'd gone in there. Resolving to honor the memory of R.W. and Bill, James finally agreed to perform again. The Blackwood Brothers Quartet was reborn, with J.D. Sumner singing bass and James' nephew Cecil Blackwood as baritone. Their first concert together was scheduled for Clanton, Alabama, the site of the plane crash. This was about a, a month and a half after the plane crash, and right back to the airport hangar, we did a concert without even rehearsal. Bill Shaw, James Black with Cecil Black with J.D. Sumner, Jackie Marshall's piano, and that started our career back up there at the airport with several thousand people there to hear us, and Elaine Blackwood, R.W.'s widow, Ruth Lyles, Bill Lyles' widow, they were there, and the kids, we introduced them. But I remember being there, I remember them introducing Cecil, but I think the one that got me the most was J.D. Sumner. All I know is I saw a guy just stand up, looked like he, looked like he went all the way to the top of the mountain, as big as he was. J.D. Sumner built a bridge that night to R.W.'s son, Ron, establishing a loving bond that would last for the rest of his life. We didn't actually know that he was involved in, in drugs until one night he was busted for drugs here, possession in, in Memphis. And he, uh, he didn't want to call us, uh, but he called Jimmy, and of course Jimmy called us. We went, went down to the city jail and that was um, one of the worst nights my wife and I, I suppose, ever spent us to go in and see our baby behind bars. My mom and dad came down to, uh, to the jail, like, I don't know, some ungodly hour of the morning. And they were obviously crushed, just heartbroken. When they turned to leave after we had visited for a while, my mom said, uh, your mom and dad love you. That's my mom and dad. It doesn't say, didn't say we approve of what you've done. We didn't, it didn't say, well, you should have done this or you should have done that. But we love you and we're with you. And that's, what our, that's what's kept our family together. You know, I think that's one of the reasons that, uh, that I have such a healthy image of God. Because it doesn't matter how badly I've behaved or performed or how much I've disappointed them. Uh, I have never for one moment doubted their love for me. Uh, that's probably the point that I started turning around. We, we prayed for him during all of this time, just, just prayed that God would uh, reach him, whatever it took to reach him. And I, we felt that our prayers certainly were, were answered. And they took one look at me and wouldn't let me in the waiting room with the sick people. I was that bad looking just to walk in. Uh, they put me in a little isolation room and the doctor said, we're putting you in the hospital right now. We think you've got hepatitis. And so they put me in the hospital and began running the test. This was on a Friday, I believe. And they started with blood tests and then they had arranged the x-ray and then uh, I think the Monday was the CAT scan. He was so weak by then he couldn't even suck water through a straw. It's almost like life was slipping away. And I don't know, it wasn't an out-of-body kind of experience. It just felt like I was just getting to the point of just sinking so much deep into the, into the bed, the hospital bed, that I would just fall right through it. When nobody would touch me, nobody, they were scared of me. Uh, I was an outcast. And I understand. I, I, I don't blame them. I understand. But I was seeking forgiveness. That's all. I Just give me a chance. J.D. Summer was a real man of God. He reached out to me when I needed so bad. I got out of prison in Texarkana, Texas. I got on a bus and rode to Knoxville, Tennessee. Got there at four in the morning, did not even know 
but one thing, I was going to get there, and J.D. told me he'd give me a job. That's all I knew. M didn't know how much money, nothing. I got off the bus and at four in the morning. There stood J.D. Soldier. Nothing's more beautiful than a good old gospel song. And that's why I'm so proud to be a part of a series that brings these spiritual melodies to life. These are the true stories of the singers and songwriters who use their gifts to spread God's message all over the world. It's more than the music, it's a calling. And we'd like to share it with you.